Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. We appreciate you taking your time out of your day to discuss getting back to work as our area slides into the yellow phase. I'd like to kick this over to UNIVEST's very own Andrew Detweiler. Thanks, Emily. Well, welcome. We're so glad that you could be here on our webinar today with uh, myself and Dr. Aldifer. Uh, well, his, there's his camera. I uh, wanted to give a couple thank yous real quick. Uh, first and foremost, Dr. Aldifer, thank you so much for taking the time with us this afternoon just to talk about everything you've done up to this point with your surge plan, your reentry plan, um, and where we're going to go from there. Uh, the next person I want to say thank you to is Steve over at the Indian Valley Chamber. Thank you for pushing this out to your members. I know he said uh, he wanted to give a special thank you to all of his members out there, so I know you haven't seen them in a while. And uh, the last thank yous are just here at Unifest. So thank you, Emily Spaulding, Jamie Della Croce, and Ken Rush for putting this all together and making this happen today. So I really appreciate that. The next thing, just real quick, is our agenda and what we're looking to talk about today. So we want to really hit three main topics. We want to talk about the cases in the United States and um, how that impacted states specifically that opened up early. So we're going to look at cases in Florida and in Georgia. We're going to see how that trended with Pennsylvania as we have remained mainly closed throughout this period of time. We're then going to take that macro view and we're going to take it all the way down to Bucks Montgomery County. And that's why we said we're focusing on the Delaware Valley to see really what this, how this impacted our immediate area, not skewing results, whether it be from Philadelphia or Pittsburgh or other areas or other hot spots. We wanted to focus just on Bucks Montgomery County as well. So we're going to look at the data first. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the um, ways businesses are going to reopen. So we timed this right before Montgomery County is going to go to green. So, or excuse me, to yellow. So we've been in red for a long time, and now we're looking to move to yellow and what that's going to take. Um, it was actually ironic. Today's my first day back in the office. So I've been out since March 13th. It was a Friday and uh, basically worked most of the day here. And then today was my first day back. And one thing I've learned throughout this process is it's hard to change habits. I think it takes the human about 30 days to form a habit. And it's very hard to break once you get to that point. So I want to talk about what it's going to look like to bring employees back from a leadership perspective, because you don't want to just force them to come back. We really want to draw them so they want to come back. So that's going to be a main portion of what we're going to talk about. The last thing we want to talk about um, on our agenda is how can you make your customers feel safe to do business with us again? Essentially, how can you make money again? And this is going to look very different for each one of your businesses. What works for Univest in bringing our customers back might be very different for a restaurant chain, and it might be very different for a manufacturing company. So we want to leave a lot of time at the end to talk about questions that you might have for Dr. Aldifer about what it looks like to actually bring your customers back, because that's really what keeps this economy going. So that's our agenda for the day. Uh, we're going to get through this if probably within three to four hours, we're hoping, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, no, we'll have you out of here in 45 minutes. But Dr. Aldifer, I want to introduce him. He is a U10 medical school graduate. He uh, was Philadelphia Magazine's top doc in 2018, 2019, and 2020. No pressure for 2021 now, just so you know. <laughs> uh, 50, he has run 15 consecutive Boston marathons. His last one was actually in 2015 and was there for, unfortunately, when there was the bombing there. Um, and his claim to fame, something we were talking about just before this, was he was one of the last people to interview Arlen Specter on his radio show, and Arlen had just finished having lunch with Joe Biden right before he hopped on to talk to Dr. Aldifer on his radio show. So that's who we have for today. Uh, Dr. Aldifer, I want to kick it over to you so you can start talking about some of our staff. Andrew, thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, I did a radio show for three years at uh, WNPV. So I actually had the opportunity to do Common Pleas by Univest, sitting in for Daryl Berger one or two times. So uh, we're back at Univest. I'm not sure Univest was happy with those times I sat in for Daryl, because Daryl was outstanding as a uh, voice for Univest over those years. But yeah, I appreciate the opportunity, uh, Andrew. You know, this is something that we got, uh, we all came upon it, you know, in our various careers and businesses that was thrust upon us back at the beginning of March. Um, and from a hospital-based standpoint, we got a, I was on a conference call at the beginning of March as we initiated sort of our disaster plan. And you're on a broad conference call, and somebody on the conference call said, uh, Todd, can you take care of managing the acute inpatient surge plan to figure out how to handle all these patients? 
that might be coming our way because we were in the middle of seeing what was occurring in New York City at the time, which you know looked like Armageddon, and you're expecting it just to drift south to us. So uh, how do you say no in the middle of a conference call with a lot of people? So uh, I drew the short straw and uh, you know ended up in charge of our acute care uh, surge plan, which really was trying to figure out you know, how could we somehow figure out how to double uh, our capacity um, to handle a gigantic load of patients that may be coming all of a sudden? So, you know, it, it took a little bit of creativity, but the bottom line is that it took us putting together a multidisciplinary group of really key stakeholders from a very wide variety of areas, uh, making sure that everybody knew right away that they were valued and that everyone was on equal footing from the very beginning. Um, and that the first thing we had to make sure of, which will become a theme as we talk today, is that the only corner that you couldn't cut was the safety corner. You had to make sure that patients, families, and staff uh, were ultimately safe no matter what plan we put together. And you had to just go, go beyond. And that sometimes that meant spending in areas that you weren't sure you should be spending because safety had to be prime. And also recognizing that the tiniest little speed bump can grind everything to a halt when you're trying to put together plans that are very different from what you're used to running. Um, and so you had to allow open expression from everybody all along the way and really encourage a lot of open, creative, out of the box thinking and sharing because we were putting things together as everybody else on this call did in their businesses. You know, you turned on a dime, you know. So for us at the hospital, it required uh, people like engineering and maintenance and facilities management became absolutely critical for us to try and figure out airflow management, um, from an airflow safety standpoint, you know, how your airflow mixed with other spaces. Uh, we had physicians and nurses and respiratory technicians on those committees. We met very frequently because things were very dynamic and changing within a day, not even just day to day. Um, and we planned to say, you know, what's the biggest, best possible thing we can do with what space we had? So we found value in meeting very frequently, even for shorter periods of time, to walk and talk, to site survey as we were going to challenge each other's thoughts, to rethink very quickly, and then rechallenge again, you know, and accepting that things weren't always going to be perfect, and that you're looking for sometimes you're looking for the least bad plan um, that was still ultimately safe. Um, and then after that, after we had the maximum plan for capacity uh, that was safe, you had to then, of course, figure out could we actually do it, and then can we actually staff it? But those became sort of secondary concerns because you had to be ready to handle it uh, first. And then after that, we had to handle the issue of staff training and staff redeployment because you don't magically have staff to fill and accommodate a doubling of your volume. So that's sort of how I got wrapped into this, uh, Andrew. And now, as our volumes have drifting down, as we'll see, you know, we're in the process of designing the recovery plan for the hospital, which started about three weeks ago. Um, and I think we're going to get into some of the things that we've learned from the surge planning and what we've learned from the beginnings of the recovery planning from a business standpoint. So essentially, you put in all the planning for this, but the good news is you didn't actually have to execute on it, which was great. Do you look at all the planning that you did as a waste because you didn't have to execute on it, or did that show you some valuable insights that you're going to carry forward? Uh, we executed certainly on parts of it. Our issue uh, for us, because so much elective procedures ground to a halt and because the majority of people and patients in the community were scared to death to leave their house, to come to the emergency room or go to the urgent care office or go to the doctor's office, you know, our uh, regular volume of things dwindled down dramatically. Things like, um, you know, heart emergencies and things like that dwindled down dramatically. Um, and uh, so, uh, I'm not sure if I lost you there. Did I lose you? Nope. Yeah, See you there? Yeah. Okay. So the, um, they, they dwindled down. So we had about, at most, we had about 20 patients with uh, the coronavirus in the hospital and 11 in the ICU, and nine uh, of those were intubated. So we had a significantly larger volume, and we actually had to open up uh, extended ICUs and some other things like that. So we implemented significant parts of the plan. And, and we're stressed, but not to the point that the hospital itself was overwhelmed or overrun as, say, New York City was. Okay. Well, that's a good thing. That's great to hear in Pennsylvania. So, excellent. And just to confirm, I, I may have missed this, but I also want to point out, this was for Grandview Hospital specifically, right? 
That is correct, yeah. Okay. Wonderful. All right, well, by all means, maybe you want to take us through now your macro view that you were talking about all the way down to the local view. Yeah, so we put together, uh, you know, just some slides to try and sort of frame the context of the problem. And the first slide here we'll go through quick is just a uh, cases per day of the coronavirus in the United States. That, so these were tested positive. And you can see there was a very rapid exponential rise of the cases and then a gradual drifting down. And so we're right now down from about 32,000 cases a day down to around 19,000 cases a day in the United States. So down about 40% in volume. Um, then I think the next one, uh, if you guys are flipping them. Yeah, there you go. So one of the things people start to worry about since today or tomorrow is our reopening day is what happens when we reopen? What happened Memorial Day when all the beaches opened in Jersey? Does that mean in uh, seven days, is everybody gonna have the coronavirus from that? So two of the states we'll look at here quick are Florida and Georgia. Florida and Georgia both opened around or began to open around the beginning of May. And you can see they initially had you know, fairly exponential rises in cases per day, then they began to drift, then they opened. And now since opening, they've sort of been oscillating in sort of a, uh, a smaller case volume of around 700, 800 cases a day and haven't really seen a big bounce or a big bump up yet. It's sort of smoldering. And the next one is Georgia, which did the same thing. Um, and again, Georgia also had a slower rise and a slower fall, but they've just, since they opened uh, around the beginning of May or the last week of April, they've just been smoldering in a small case volume uh, of around 700 cases a day as well, too. So those two southern states, uh, we have not, that two of the larger states that opened up early, we haven't seen a giant bounce, but, we all, but what we've seen is not a continual decline. We've seen sort of a continued smoldering. And I think that becomes an important thing for us to recognize as we open up tomorrow, or t in this area, you know, tomorrow in Pennsylvania, as far as our expectations of how we should manage this from a business standpoint. Um, and then the next one would be uh, Pennsylvania's uh, actual numbers. So bringing it back to home. So Pennsylvania peaked sort of the middle of April, and then we've had a continual progressive decline from a peak of around uh, 1,700 cases a day down to around 600 cases a day. So we're down 65% in our case per day volume of new cases in Pennsylvania, and it's been a slow, steady decline. Now, most of us would expect that as we open up, we're going to see that begin to sort of smolder and oscillate in some area south of 1,000 cases per day is a guess. One of the things that you'll learn, uh, I think, that we talk about is that the one person uh, who's wrong that you hear is the person who thinks he's right right now, because we really don't know what we're talking about. Um, because we're learning as we go every day. So you have to be very careful for saying things, uh, standing on a large, tall podium and speaking pontifically. So the next one, I think, gets into the delta, the difference. What uh, I find case per day volume very difficult to analyze because we're not testing everybody anymore. We have 10 times the capacity, or maybe not 10, but certainly five times the capacity and ability to test people but not everybody's getting tested that comes to the hospital or energy care, or their primary care office. We're treating a lot of people presumptively. So I'm not sure what to make of testing because certainly today's testing doesn't compare to a month ago and even two months ago related to availability. But inpatients in a hospital is a really rock hard number. Um, were they sick enough to be at the hospital? So in Pennsylvania, we peaked at around 2,800 patients were in the hospital in Pennsylvania with the, the coronavirus. As of yesterday morning, we were down to 1,230. So we've had about, we're about 40% of our peak, 45% of peak. So we've seen a slow, a steady decline there. And if you can go then next is the Montgomery County uh, numbers, I believe. Uh, flip over there. We'll see a chart. And this is cases per day. Again, not my favorite uh, metric, although it's the one that's on the news every single day. Um, it's just It's just not great data. It's very unclean data. But you've seen our rise in Montgomery County, a drop and now sort of an oscillation of around about 70 cases per day in Montgomery County, down from a peak of about 160 cases per day. And next would be the, uh, the hospitalization data in Montgomery County, a better metric. And you see at our peak, we were at 460 inpatients in Montgomery County, 
and we're down to about 188 as of yesterday morning. So again, another drop of about 45% in inpatients. One of the challenges is that these patients who are very sick, uh, especially when they end up in an intensive care unit and on a ventilator, they're there a long time. Uh, uh, and so the death data oftentimes trails the hospitalization data a good bit because these people will spend two, four or five weeks in an ICU on a ventilator, the ones that are very sick. So the next slide then is Bucks County, since that's uh, where I'm sitting as opposed to where you're sitting, Andrew. And Bucks County shows uh, a similar pattern. We've had a much slower rise in Bucks County, not sort of that exponential growth, but a peak and a decline. And again, now sort of an oscillation of around 30 new cases a day in Bucks County. Again, not sure what that means. So if we look at hospitalization data in Bucks County, it again shows a similar curve to what we've seen in Pennsylvania, in Montgomery, and here in Bucks. So we had a peak of 159 cases, uh, patients in the hospital in Bucks County back uh, in April, and now we're down to about 46 as of yesterday morning, and sort of oscillating in that area now a little bit between 40 and 60 patients in the hospital in Bucks County. And again, we're now, that's about 35% of peak. So down a good bit, um, but again, we're not gonna drop right off. We're gonna, I think for a couple of reasons, these people that get sick, they stay there a long time. And also because I think we're gonna see this smoldering phenomenon where uh, this disease is gonna be with us for a while, uh, for one of a variety of reasons. Yesterday, I hosted a, uh, a one-hour webinar, um, and my the guy I was interviewing was uh, Dr. Paul Offit, who is a, a legendary pediatric infectious disease specialist. He designed, discovered and designed the rotavirus vaccine, and uh, you know I had the great pleasure, from my perspective, scientifically, hearing his thoughts and ideas about where vaccine is going and where the case curve is going. But in general, most people think we're going to have a smoldering phenomenon here for, you know, at least the next six to 12 months, and it's not going to magically go away, which I think is the segue then for you, Andrew, into how are we as businesses, myself as a, you know, a private practicing cardiologist, um, as a representative of a hospital working up there and everyone else out there, how are we going to readjust, get back in here and make ourselves feel safe, our businesses safe and our customers safe? Um, as we deal with this over the next 12 months until we have widely disseminated vaccine therapies. So how, how dangerous is it going to be? And you, you've used the term that it's going to be in a, we're in a smoldering phase. How dangerous do you think this phase really is? It sounds like the hospitals have capacity right now. Is, are we in a really dangerous time that we should be concerned as we move into yellow, right. do you think? Well, I think dangerous is a, it's a very difficult word to sort of quantify. You know, we've learned a lot about the virus um, and how it spreads and it's um, and who's at most risk, you know, and things like that and how to slow it down. So I think, if anything, we're all in a way better position to handle this medically now than we were back in March. We've learned a ton. We have the capacity of all those things we need, hospitals, ICU beds, ventilators, uh, masks. Um, we've learned a ton about PPE and, and, and things like that. So I think we've learned a ton, uh, but we've most importantly, from a danger standpoint, we've learned who's at high risk. Um, and you can't do public, you can't manage public health by you know idiosyncratic one-off examples. You have to man man manage public health by what's happening to the majority of people. And quite clearly, that's the elderly and it's the immunosuppressed and people with chronic comorbid medical conditions. That doesn't mean you're not going to have a 30-year-old get it, go on the ventilator, and die. You're going to have that when things are affecting large volumes of people. You're going to have you know, idiosyncratic one-off examples, but you can't manage by that. And I don't think since we can't manage that medically by that, we can't necessarily operate our businesses like that either. Um, you know, so we know now that the mortality of people over the age of 65 in general, you know, is probably around one and a half percent. We also know that the mortality in people under the age of 25 is about one in a million. You know, but wow. that doesn't mean you don't get it. It doesn't mean you can't die from it. You know, uh, because in this day and age, you'll hear about every 20 year old that dies, you know, and yeah. we're in a country of 330 million. So you're going to hear about it. Um, but and right now, the way the case numbers are in, in, in Bucks and Montgomery County, about one in every 1500 people um, are potentially contagious to you. Just so if you think about it from a perspective. Wow. Um, so one in 1500. But you know, a lot of us in our any given day, we probably come in reasonable contact with you know, a thousand people. If you walk through the supermarket and you walk through the Home Depot and you go through a while off for your coffee and you go to work, 
you know, it's, so it's not un, it's a large, it's not everywhere, um, but we're going to have to deal with it. So the habits that we've gotten through this just in the past few months with using hand sanitizer and other types of PPE, those are great habits that we should carry forward no matter what, just because of all the other diseases out there you're saying as well. Yeah, I think it's just going to have to be, be smart, be safe. Um, you know, it's hard not to have OCD right now about these things, but by the same token, you have to recognize the, the bigger context and the bigger picture as well, too. And everybody is going to find their own comfort level. So you have to find the comfort level for yourself and make sure that you recognize the comfort level of the people around you to try and match that. You may be comfortable in certain situations, but the other people next to you may not be. Uh, and you may not know other people's risk factors either uh, as well. Well, and I think that's a great segue to our next point then of what is it going to look like now, especially let's just say tomorrow, we are looking to move into the yellow phase from red. Now opening our businesses back up at a limited capacity, uh, what's it going to look like? Well, that's interesting. You know, everybody is uh, paranoid and afraid that we're going to have a run on the beach as if it's, uh, you know, college uh, spring break, you know, all over the place. And, and I think it's incumbent upon all of us to be, you know, wise and smart and not make it spring break at Walmart, you know, uh, locally. Um, and it's incumbent upon us as, you know, businesses, you know, for example, as we opened up the last three weeks as a medical practice, you know, we haven't had our patients in the waiting rooms. They come in, they check in, they go to their car and they wait in their car in the parking lot. And then we call them when they're ready and then they come in and then we try and direct our traffic in one door and out the other door. You know, so there's every, every individual entity is going to be unique because nobody has the same geography, the same building, the same space, the same challenges. So you want to try and create flow um, that doesn't crowd people and that doesn't keep them around. So we, we know that the things that uh, from a community, there's very little community spread, meaning there's very little spread just out in the wide open at Walmart or, you know, the supermarket. Uh, there's very little open air spread outside right now. So our issues are what we would say are congregate living facilities, you know, so everybody living in the same house close together or, you know, skilled nursing units, for example, or uh, CCRCs or businesses where people are congregated close together, where you're mixing the airflow for a prolonged period of time. So it's indoors, it's prolonged exposure, and it's uh, close connection are your highest risk you know, spaces, outdoors, not so much, limited exposure, not so much, you know, the drive through window at Chick-fil-A, probably not a big, you know, a big exposure. Thank goodness. My kids would not be able to survive if we didn't have Chick-fil-A. So thank goodness for that. Um, so I want to also just say, so we're going to talk about a few things now about building a reentry plan. So I just want to say, if you're listening in, this is your time to start asking questions. Think of specific questions. There's a chat box that you can ask that that goes directly to us, and then we can ask those questions at the end. So Todd, if you want to start talking about whether it be this slide or the next one about what a reentry plan is going to look like, and then we'll field questions at the end. Yeah, sure. So I, I sort of break this in my head in the way we've done it at the hospital and then in our own practice you know, is to, is to two ways. One is just flat out safety. Another then is our employees have to come back first. And then thirdly, as our customers and successful, you know, uh, recovery. And so from a safety standpoint, the answer is you just have to make that the priority. Whether or not you're fully bought in in the past or now, if you want to be successful, you just got to say safety is the priority. And the one way you can do that is by pulling up the CDC business guidelines and say, that's become my Bible because that's what people are gonna hold you to. That's the standard. You may not love it all, but you need to do the best that you can to sort of follow those guidelines. And those guidelines in reality have become common sense for us for the past three months. It's about spacing, it's about hygiene, it's about duration of exposure, it's about lim you know, putting up barriers so you know, you're not you know, uh, feeling people spit when they're talking at you, you know, and those kinds of things. And it all may feel like it's overdone, the problem is what happens for us, one, is not the other. We don't know who is on the other side that we're interacting with. And then I think that you have to make sure that that environment is safe for our employees. I can tell you, the employees don't want to come back, a lot of them. Not that they don't want to work, but they're afraid, you know, and they've seen nothing but fear, you know, preached, you know, uh, on the news media and everywhere else, you know, nonstop. 
So it's become hard, whether that's real or not, it has, it's become ingrained in them. So we need to make the environment comfortable for our employees to want to come back. And then also, not just the environment comfortable and safe for the employees but and for the customers, but your employees have to create, have to feel safe so they can create the experience that is safe for the customer. Because we all know uh, that it's our employees that have the big interaction with our customers and our customers are never going to feel safe if they can tell that the employees are nervous. And then I think uh, the other thing is that the reality is if this is going to be smoldering in our environments, all of us are likely to have an employee or customers that were in our office or connected with it or that came into our facilities that end up positive for the coronavirus. And you have to say, you know, report that stuff as soon as you can. Contact the Department of Health. The Department of Health in both counties and all the counties around here in Pennsylvania have become very good, very responsive. They take on ownership of these things, and you don't have to. You don't have to have your own Department of Health in your institution and do your own contact tracing. It's not what you do. Let's farm that out to the people that do it and do it well. And they've become very, very good at it. You know, we've reported many people, and they'll follow your employee through. They'll do the contact tracing that's needed, and they'll tell you. If you need to change anything in your facility or modify it, they'll come out and do site assessments. So what businesses so then, should be uh, doing at this point, I would say, is not to cut you off. But what businesses should be doing is, and on our side on the insurance, is with workers' comp. Hopefully your employees never get hurt, but in the event an employee gets hurt, you follow these three steps of how to report a claim and get things moving. It sounds like what you're recommending is employers and the managers and supervisors should say, when and if we have a COVID-19 case, what are the next steps that we take? Have that mapped out ahead of time, right? Yeah, I would have that out as a procedure. And I would make sure that all your employees know that if someone in your household is positive or you are positive, I mean, obviously you can't violate HIPAA, so it becomes voluntary self-reporting. But, you know, I would make it clear to all your employees that this is what we want you to, we hope you feel comfortable coming to us and we will help you. If you're, your mom that you live with uh, or lives in your house is positive, please let us know. We'll help you with the Department of Health, you know, and things like that, because then you need it for the business. Yeah, have a plan in place so that it doesn't become the Keystone Cops when it happens um, and make sure everyone's comfortable with it. Okay, excellent. So you have so some good the, stats uh, here as far as what it was going to look like then uh, for businesses, right? Oh, well, I think that uh, stats, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's interesting. I think, that, uh, I think that what we did was since everybody is – very fearful right now and since the uh it's, everyone hates change um you know i think getting your toes wet is probably the good plan you know have a phased in plan we changed our plan uh once a week for three weeks at the hospital as we have gradually added steps in the way and one of the interesting things we found is that everybody was afraid to get started and everyone's afraid of the bounce the recurrent you know cases and all these other things um, but living in this never never land of 25% normal, 50% normal, and then 25% the other or 75% the other is extremely unsettling and uncomfortable for people uh, and employees. And as you come back from getting your toes wet, they get a little bit comfortable at a lower volume and they build up. When it gets to in that halfway part where they're half the old way, half the new way, half on the internet, half on the street corner, the employees will be the ones that will start pulling you back towards normal because it's going to be very hard to push your employees who are fearful towards normal. But what you want to do is create that environment where your employees are coming to you at the, on Thursday and saying, please, can we tomorrow plan how to make us one step closer to normal on Monday? Because you don't want to feel like you're pushing general up a hill. You want to feel like you're rolling, rolling balls down a hill. And right now, early on, if you go too fast, you're pushing jello uphill, and that's always very, very difficult. Um, and I think they'll yearn for it. They'll want to get there. The real question then becomes one, I think, on the next slide as we learn as we grow to a business is, do you want to get back to the way you were? Exactly the way you were. And I think that's an interesting question for everybody else. Um, you know, well, you uh, hear that, right? That's in the news right now. You hear a lot of, I've heard restaurants, even in this area specifically, that say they've been uh, doing just takeout only and they don't have lots of employees and things like that. And they're just nervous to make that jump to go back to now what it used to be like. So, yeah, there are things to take out of this for sure. Yeah, I'd like yeah. to get rid of the term uh, the new normal too 
Um, because all I right. think all of us, no, nobody on this call has been successful by doing the same thing every day for the last 10 years. You know, that, that, you know, as most people will say, you're, you're only doing one of two things. You're either growing or you're shrinking. And if you think you're standing still, you're shrinking. You just haven't realized it yet. Um, so none of us is normal. I think that the question for me right now in healthcare, and I think it applies to all of us, is, is this actually an opportunity for us to do something different and learn from it in a different way? Um, you know, for us, the obvious example in healthcare is telehealth, you know, how that has changed. It's one of the biggest reasons it wasn't uh, utilized a ton is because of government regulations and, to be honest, reimbursement mechanisms. They didn't pay us squat for telehealth in the past, so nobody wanted to do telehealth. But now this forced the changes to reimbursement on telehealth, and now people might want to do it. And now the technology is available that wasn't available. So you match the technology and you match the reimbursement. Now you got a carrot. You got two carrots pulling you, you know, towards it. And so that so I think the question for me is, what did we learn in the lockdown? What did we learn about ourselves? What did we learn about our own businesses? What did we learn about our customers? Are there things that the customers actually enjoyed about the lockdown, about how they may interact with your business? You know, um, have we learned that there's value added services? that we can give. Like for me, telehealth probably won't go away. It will become a value added service that we can give certain customers in certain places in their lives, our life. Um, have we learned, you know, we've all learned to do with less staff or different staff or telecommuting. You know, have we learned new efficiencies in staffing and inventory and delivery and communication that we can continue uh, in, in beneficial ways to, you know, reach, serve and sell to our customers? You know, we're all looking for higher volume, lower margins. And I think there might be ways that we can find this, you know, and, and grow our businesses. So that's why I end up with that question of, um, you know, we may not want to return to 100% of the old way that, you know, that was normal. Uh, so maybe right now when we hear the term new normal, which I hate, sometimes it feels like new normal means it's less than normal. And I challenge us all to think that, can the new normal actually be better than the old normal because of how we've learned to adapt? Because, you know, the reality is that, you know, um, necessity is the mother of invention. And we've all had the necessity to do things different a whole lot. And I think it may have given us all the opportunity to invent right now and invent how can we be, you know, be better. So better than we were just a very short 90 days ago. Well, when you look at the Amazon example, right, if you would have looked 20 years ago and said that you're not going to need bookstores anymore, but you're going to go online and actually have readers with books, I mean, they adapted and look where they are now. So I think you're right. I think we need to be looking at how we can better serve our customers and not just get back to the old way, but how can we be better from it? So it's a good, good point. You would rather be Amazon than Blockbuster. That's a great way of looking at it. That's for sure. <laughs> so... I, I don't, were there any more points that you had, or we have a whole bunch of questions that actually have come in, Todd. Do you want me to start sending oh, I'm good. You, no. you can just fire them right. at me. I'm fine. All right. Well, here we go. So I don't know. I'll make date, it up and say it with confidence. Just have a big smile on your face when you say it and sound really sure of yourself. That's right. Um, as far as the data goes, do you think the, death, uh, the, the numbers that are out there, whether it be from John Hopkins' map that they have or everything we hear every night on the news, do you think that they're overstated? You know, as with any data, you can overstate, you can understate, you can undercount. None of that data is going to be accurate, and it depends, you know, how they're counted. You know, people complain that there was a, a sense of incentivization to call cases coronavirus cases because the reality is people knew that they were going to be get a portion of their uh, government, uh, I don't want to say bailout, I don't like that word, their government subsidies uh, were going to be based on the number of patients or the percentage of the population that was there. So the reality is, yeah, there may have been some uh, incentive for people to be labeled as COVID deaths because it, it gave, but I can tell you from the inside, there wasn't really a co coordinated effort to do that. I never did it. Um, but certainly the way it was set up, lots of deaths were called coronavirus deaths. That, I don't, not that they weren't, but, you know, if someone was on hospice because of lung cancer, you know, uh, and they got the coronavirus, 
they, and they died, they were labeled a death from coronavirus, not a death from lung cancer. Do you know what I mean by that? Absolutely. So, but, yeah. but I, I would argue that you know, this may not sound right, but uh, um, uh, death certificate data is some of the worst, most inaccurate data ever created in the government, and that's saying something. Okay. It's just not very good data. It's, it's never really that accurate. Okay, fair enough. Um, next question, and I know this doesn't just apply to our businesses, but it is all of our realities. Uh, and I know that you might not have a, an answer, but a guess. But do you think as far as schools in the fall, do you think they're safe to reopen? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, that's an opinion question, not a fact question. <laughs> um, I, I, and I think that, you know, when the issue is that now we know stuff that we didn't know. Um, you know, in February. So I think we should learn from that. We shouldn't just act purely out of fear and out of paranoia. Public health is a statistical probability game. You know, no matter what we do, we're not going to save every life. Um, but sometimes our actions may save lives on one end, but the collateral impact may cause more damage on the other end. And I think we need to keep that in mind, whether that's our economic actions or whether that's our reactions here. Um, and so the reality, as we know, is that, you know, kids under the age of 25, their mortality from this virus in the absence of having some underlying medical condition or immunosuppressed condition is extraordinarily low. Um, so colleges and, universe, and uh, high schools and elementary schools, if, from a kid standpoint, personal opinion, they should be open. Now, the mm -hmm. question is, they have teachers who are a little bit older. And they have grandparents who are a little bit older yet. But if we're looking at just the children, uh, yes. Then I think that you then focus your energies on the questions of the, the might the teachers get infected or the might the grandparents get infected. Might is also an opportunity, an opportunity for us to educate and focus our energies, our time, and our monies trying to protect those who are at highest risk. Probably the most challenging thing we did here out of lack of knowledge because we didn't exactly have great data coming out of China, and Italy was very unique. Uh, we took a broad brush approach of just shutting everything down because we really weren't sure. Um, but we should learn now uh, as we move through summer and the fall and try and focus our money, our attention, and our efforts on the high-risk people and try and interrupt those chains of might and, and use those as opportunity. Because it's, it's, it is damaging to not have our children in schools and socialization uh, not just for the kids, but also there's a collateral economic impact to the parents and their loss of work or the you know other things. So I think if you went purely by health, public health for the kids, they should be in school. Now we have to figure out how can we do it safely for all the others that interact with the kids. Yeah, no, and you're right. I think it's great for the kids and also the mental health of the parents having their kids at home. I can only imagine so. Well, I can actually imagine. I have three kids at home. So <laughs> great answer. I, I fully agree with your opinion on that. That's great. Um, so the next question, I like this, is as far as our staff and bringing our employees back, we live in a world where we're typically on one of two sides right now. Uh, so there's employees out there and families that are going to say, you know what, this coronavirus was a hoax. And then there's going to be other people that are legitimately terrified. There's not, and then there's, of course, people in the middle. But those are the two sides of the spectrum. How do you balance that? How do you balance those two competing sides of your employees, and how do you make them all feel like it's going to be okay? Yeah, you know, as with any le any leadership challenge like that, that that's a top down problem. Um, you know, the, it's top down, meaning that you have to create the environment at the bottom, that the bottom supports each other. But that that decision and ability is going to come from the top. So, you know, if I'm at the top and I'm not a mask believer, but I know that the people at the bottom have a diff, you know, are dissonant and disparate on their opinions of that, uh, I need to become a mask believer just so that the people at the bottom that are comfortable. You know, it's sort of like baseball, man. You're only as strong as your seventh, eighth, and ninth hitters. And the job of a coach is not to coach the one through three hitters. They can play. The job of the coach is to get the seven, eight, nine hitters to be really productive. So your job in our jobs in business are to get our, our employees. You know, it's the, not, not at the bottom of the order that's a hierarchy, but everybody needs to perform and feel comfortable performing because if they're not comfortable, they're not going to be helpful in the in 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 the business. There's going to be you know uh, interactions that are not helpful. So I think we have to create that balance among the employees and the tolerance 
of other people. People can do whatever they want on their own. They can do whatever they want when they're outside, you know, where it's uh, certainly much safer. But in close, confined, indoor, shared airflow, long day spaces, we have to, you know, respect each other and their desires. And some of those people, maybe the people that are really afraid, their best way may be to continue to find them in ways that they can telecommute. And they may be more productive in that realm. Okay. And it may not be equal because you're trying to make the whole unit be functional. Yep. Well, and that goes back to your point earlier where you were saying you want to motivate the employees to want to come back to work, not just sit there and try and push them back to work. So, okay, excellent. Um, summer's coming up. Big question. Swimming pools, do you see any date? I mean, if we're going into yellow, is this a green phase where you think they're going to be opening, or do you have any concept there? I think they're opening at the – I think they're green phases, swimming pools. I, I don't know why. Just to be clear, like I said earlier, the only person who's wrong is the one who says they're right. <laughs> because none of this is based on data, you know, whether it's, you know, 10 person congregants or 25 person congregates. I mean, it, wouldn't it be sensible that it should be people per square foot if they were actually thinking about it? And it should be different if it was outside than if it was inside, you know, so clearly it's not based on data because 10 people in a 100,000 square foot warehouse is different than 10 people in a, you know, in a cubicle. So. These are just all arbitrary things to try and get us to behave sensibly and better. So I, I, there's certainly no data that an outdoor swimming pool is a gigantic problem unless there's a thousand people in a hundred square foot pool. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Well, and that, the next question actually kind of follows that as well. I know the CDC at one point had a max number of people that are allowed in the building. Uh, what's your take on that? I mean, has the CDC given very clear guidelines of max number of people? Or is that following state's directives with Governor Wolf and his color with the phases? What's your take on that? Well, this is a very challenging thing right now because the Pennsylvania guidelines for this are um, mystical at best in that, you know, they have the 10 number out there and the 25 number out there. And then what happens when we go green? Well, the green numbers were just announced like last Thursday or something like that in the guidelines. So it's not, you know, very difficult, and does it apply to exempt businesses, you know, or, or you know, um, you know, the ones that are considered, you know, necessary businesses? Does it apply to those exempted facilities? I think you'll find a lot out this Sunday when churches start to come back. You know, do they hold to 10, 25, 100? You know, California had a court uh, a court ruling that they raised the churches raised got the number raised in court to 100. Also, a total arbitrary number. The judge just said, "I think 100 sounds better than 25 for religious institutions." But you know, there's, it's all just on the fly. But I think we are we are called to be responsible ourselves and be sensible ourselves. When the guidance isn't clear, you know, we don't want to get ourselves or employees in trouble. But I think if we're going to go, I'm not going to advocate for changing going off the guidelines, you know, uh, on a live WebEx. But I think if you do, you, you ought to feel like you're standing on firm, intelligent, respectful ground when you're doing it, um, because it, they're not clear, and because they're not based on a square footage, indoor, outdoor, you know, uh, cubic feet per, you know, a space. It, it's just not, it, and so it's very difficult. Yep. So I think you're going to see green. It's just going to open up, you know, and people are just going to start doing what they want because there's also no ability to police these regulations, and there certainly is no real ability to enforce them. But we as individuals need to try and be as compliant as we can because we have employees and our employees have families and the disease is going to smolder until we have that there. So it's going to be around us. Okay. Uh, you were talking about the green phase. Another question was, do you think masks are going to be required uh, when we go into the green phase? Uh, I don't have a crystal ball, but, you know, we live in a we live in a state here in Pennsylvania that certainly has been on the the far restrictive side of things. Um, so I, I don't know, certainly, you know, and, and whether they are required indoors or outdoors, they've been not forthcoming with this. I see it difficult to do once you go green to do anything other than recommend it, but not quote mandate it or, you know, maybe consider it indoors, but not outdoors. You know, the, the data is soft. A lot of, you know, the, the, the concept of a bandana being actually protective over your face, you know, is, uh, is comical. Um, but to some degree, 
it uh, certainly makes you stay six feet away from the guy with the bandana. You would have done that a year ago too, um, but it certainly does it now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's a very specific question about an industry. I know we have many different industries represented on here, but specifically to a dental office, do you think there's a unique risk level there at all, or, or would they be very similar to your own practice that you have? Well, I think you know, the dental thing is interesting to me because they are a profession that has practiced hygiene and PPE and safe practices for forever. I mean, they're used to this. You know, they're used to working in people's mouths with, uh, you know, um, airborne infectious things, and they've done that for forever. They've been wearing masks and face shields and gloves and gowns for a long time. So, and I think the, the dental practitioners accept that risk themselves and always have, and they're, they're doing things one-on-one. -on -one. It's not like they're in mass quantities in a dental office, you know. So I, I've always been interested why that dental practices were picked out um, as being high risk and shut down. I, I get the fact that it's aerosolization and all that stuff, um, but especially nowadays when you could get people tested and things like that, to some degree, which isn't a whole separate imperfect thing. But I think the dental practices in large part are well equipped to do this and to do it safely. In the majority of hospitals in the United States, there was relatively little transmission from patients to staff. Um, shy of Italy, where it happened a lot because they ran out a lot of, a, of a lot of PPE. And there was hundreds of doctors and nurses that died in Italy of the coronavirus. But that's because they flat out ran out of stuff and they were just taking care of highly infectious people with nothing. And there's only a handful of that that happened in New York. There was some of that in New York City. But in general, the infection rate of patient to person using really good PPE has been fairly low. And I think that should be, you know, correlated over to the dental practices as well. Okay, excellent. Yeah, I was funny you said that because I've been wondering the same thing. I feel like my dentist always is fully covered. I'm surprised they don't have Tyvek suits on. And just to hear that, I, you know, they were closed down has blown my mind. So uh, re very reassuring for sure. Um, another question is, what's your thoughts on, we all keep hearing about the second wave potentially coming. Do you think that is a real possibility in the fall? So, um, again, if I, anyone who says anything, they're definitely wrong because you don't know. But I'm a believer, and I think many people are becoming more of a believer of this theory that our second wave, from a healthcare standpoint, is going to be the pent up healthcare issues that have been ignored by people the past three months. That that wave of people that have not been seeking care for a variety of things, or that haven't had their mammograms or their colonoscopies. You know, in general, in the United States, we find about 20,000 cases of breast cancer and colon cancer per month from screening mammograms and screening colonoscopies. So we've had three months. So in theory, we've uh, 60,000 cases of breast cancer and colon cancer have gone undiagnosed or delayed diagnosis. So that's just an example. You know, presentation for acute heart attacks are down 40%. Um, why? Probably because people are sitting indoors and not doing anything. Sort of like the first snow shot, the, the first snow comes out, and they're all going to come out of their uh, lockdown and start doing yard work, and all of a sudden they're going to have chest pain. So I, I'm a believer that that's a big issue, and I think the the healthcare impacts of the economic lockdown are delayed also, um, whether that be from poverty or food insecurity, um, uh, depression, anxiety. Uh, an increase in opioid dependence. Those, I think, are going to be large, a larger second wave than any bump we're going to see from the recurrence of the coronavirus. Um, I think we're going to have a, a smolder and some dips and valleys and some pockets of, of uh, outbreaks, um, but I doubt we're going to see a New York City again uh, or a North Jersey again. I think we're better able to handle that, understand it. Smoldering, pocket outbreaks, you know, some bumps in the road, but other things as well, too. The other thing that makes us feel better about that is this is a single-stranded RNA virus that thus far, uh, it has not shown a high potential for mutation. Um, and so one of the things we worry about is the more often a virus mutates, like the HIV virus does, it makes it very difficult to make a vaccine. Um, and also the more commonly that it mutes, more frequent that it mutates, there's the possibility that it mutates into a more aggressive form that could then 
be the spike of a new outbreak or a new exponential rise. This virus does not mutate all that much. And that's encouraging from our standpoint, makes us feel like, because most viruses that don't mutate a lot, uh, they then tend to smolder. Um, and uh, aggressive viruses like Ebola virus tends to kill its host very quickly. So Ebola virus outbreaks don't last all that terribly long and they don't spread all that terribly far because they kill their host too quick to spread. The more problematic are the viruses that, you know, um, that don't do that. And natural history is the virus will sort of be less virulent with time and then smolder absent a mutation that makes it more virulent again. That's also the reason why there's every expectation that we're not going to have one vaccine a year from now. We'll probably have three vaccines available a year from now. Um, if, if they're available earlier, it'll be, because, it'll be because they got pulled through the process early without perfect data, but with safety data and with immunogenicity data, but not perfect um, efficacy data. Because the, the vaccine trials for efficacy data take a long time and 30,000, 50,000 people. Okay. So the new thing that we keep hearing about is that temperature screening is going to be a very big thing. There's even kiosks being developed that you just either a customer or an employee can walk, stand in front of, and they're, they're measured. Uh, do, you, do you see a lot of value in that? Uh, I mean, it seems like that's going to be something that we're all going to be faced with. I think there's value. Certainly South Korea was very successful with this, uh, temperature screening and symptom screening. It's certainly not perfect because obviously not everybody with this has a fever. Um, but you're trying to, you know, you know, call a portion of the people out there. And so if you can catch 50% of the people out there with temperature screening, and I think symptom screening and the question screening, you know, have you been around somebody with it? Have you been feeling okay? Cough, fever, blah, blah, blah. And the temperature screening. And it also gives people a sense of safety and security. And people get used to it. We're, you know, uh, uh, they get used to getting the temperature wand on their forehead or however you choose to do it. Um, but I think it becomes uh, an important part of how we bring our business back together of the employees, because the employees are the ones who are going to be working congregately together. You know, you're not going to need a temperature screen before the drive through at your Chick-fil-A, um, but maybe the workers in Chick-fil-A. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and this might be an HR question. I'm not sure, but uh, can you get everyone in your office tested just to give a peace of mind? And I know that, that would only tell you a snapshot of a period in time, but is that something that you can do, or are there specific people that should be tested in an office? So this is a giant controversy that was kicked off, you know, what's well, out there, you know, the uh, one of the Montgomery County Commissioners recommended that, you know, it started at, at every skilled nursing resident and every employee in a, uh, in a skilled nursing home get tested every week. And then the governor picked that up a, a week later and said the same thing. Well, that is profoundly difficult and profoundly expensive um, uh, for a test that tells you that you're negative today. It doesn't tell you that you're ne on Monday you tested negative. Lord knows what you are on Wednesday. Um, so unless you're going to come up with a plan to test somebody every single day at $50 to $100 a pop for each one of these PCR tests right now, I mean, you can do the math. Um, and it's not cheap. You know, if you have 500, you know, 500 residents and employees combined, it's going to cost you a couple of million dollars a year to do that. Um, you know, uh, so it's not easy for something that's not perfect. And as the prevalence of the disease in the community goes down and decreases, as the cases drop and smolder but don't go away, that means that the false negative rate goes up. And you may give people a false sense of security that is not Worth that, worth that much. So the test also is, the tests are very, very good, the PCR tests are, when they're done right. The problem is anybody out there who's had a nasopharyngeal swab done, it feels like they're sticking a hot poker into your middle of your brain. Um, and if it didn't feel like that, they probably didn't do it right. So one of the biggest problems here is the uh, sample acquisition, is that you have to have really good sample acquisition, or it doesn't matter how good the test is, it's going to be negative. If somebody just swabbed the tip of your nose, you're going to be negative when, in fact, you may actually be positive. So there's a lot of variables in widespread community and office and business-based testing that makes it difficult. It's not like it's a retinal scan or a thumbprint. It's not a biometric scan. Um, okay. So it's a little bit – and right now, you know, uh, there are some that are available quickly where you can get a result in, you know, 15 minutes to an hour. But still, it's the issue of sample acquisition. And it's a, it's a statistical probability game. 
if the pretest probability is very low that you've got the disease because you're afebrile, no symptoms, no contacts, um, and, uh, and the prevalence is not common in the area, you're going to have a lot of false negatives. So the mm -hmm. negative predictive value will not be good in those settings. So that, but, you know, a lot of this, whether it's from whatever the federal government or the state government has been driven by fear, not by really good science and public health science. Uh, we have a number of questions left, but we are getting to time. Uh, I'll ask you one more. Um, as far as these antibody testing, you were just talking about accuracy, but antibody tests is another thing. Do you see that being accurate? Is that worthwhile in your opinion? So there's like uh, 200 companies right now with uh, proposals before uh, the, the uh, FDA for emergency use, use, use authorization. There are several antibody tests out there right now that are very good. Very good in this industry, and that's, this segment means 100% sensitive and greater than 99.5% specific. So anything that doesn't demonstrate those numbers is not going to hold up to large things of antibody screening. So there are some that are good, but you got to be very wary because there's a lot of stuff that looks may sound good, but in a statistical probability game is just not good enough. So if you test positive for the antibody with a good system, there's a 93% chance that that's correct. Um, what we know is then that you had the virus, you were exposed to the virus. What we don't know is how much protection that response affords you um, and how durable, how long lasting is that response. More and more and more, we think that it provides you some level of safety. You probably will be protected from moderate to severe disease you know, with a recurrent infection. You may not be protected from mild disease. We're all used to that from the flu vaccine, right? You get the flu vaccine and you may not be in the hospital from the flu, but you still got the headache and the sniffles for two days kind of thing. Um, but again, the flu vaccine doesn't last more than a year. That's why you got to get it every year. So we don't know how much protection that affords you, and we don't know the durability of it to some degree. But I would rather be PCR nasal swab negative and antibody positive than anything else. So to answer your question, um, somebody who's antibody positive, an employee who's antibody positive, I would rather have that employee working with high-risk customers, say, in a skilled nursing unit that have not had it, than someone who's antibody negative, if you follow the logic there. Absolutely. Because then you're having people who have some sense of immunity are less likely to get the disease, to the disease and be communicable working with people that are high-risk to get if they get it. Makes complete sense. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Dr. Oliver. We are at time, like I had said, and um, we will have this recorded. So if anybody that is on this, we will send a link out. You're more than welcome to go back. If you want to send it to anybody else, uh, please, by all means, feel free. If there were questions that were asked uh, that you did not get answered or you have specific questions, I'd say you're more than welcome to uh, email myself. I, there's going to be a, that displayed on the screen, detweilera at univest.net. I'll be happy to forward that on to Todd, and then, um, yeah, we'll get back sure. to you with any questions you have specifically, but uh, the biggest thing we want to do was, was bring you something of value, that bringing your employees back, what it's going to look like tomorrow in the weeks and months ahead. So uh, if you're watching, I hope you got value. Dr. Oliver, thank you so much for your time uh, and your insights. Really do appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity. Hope everyone has a great day. Thank you.